Hi. <laughs> Hi, Steinbeck. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cameras and Coffee. And as promised at the end of the last video, today we're going to talk about the situation with large format shutters and lenses and why that is a big impediment to the future of film photography. I uh, actually was going to do that in the previous video, but I realized that I that was like eight or nine minutes and that video needed to be about the on-do camera. So I'm re-recording and uh, we're going to talk about it today with the help of many visual aids. But first, the intro. Okay, for today's coffee, once again from Pear Roasters, I am enjoying the Congo, which tastes of baker's chocolate and dried raspberry, and I made it into an oat milk latte, meant to make an oat milk cappuccino, but goofed. It's good, it's good, that's a good coffee. Um, I do kind of get that like baker's chocolate bitterness out of it, so at any rate, um, talk about sheet format shutters and lenses. So generally speaking, I think that the future of film photography is likely to be sheet film, just simply because the cameras are easier to make. And in theory, the shutter should be easier to make. And we'll talk about why that is shortly. Uh, it's, it's very complicated, mechanically very complicated to make a manual film camera for medium format and 35 millimeter, as I'm sure Rico is finding out in spades right now, and they have admitted to this as much in some of their videos as they go forward and try to do that project. There are some advantages to large format over the smaller formats in terms of engineering. The lenses can be much simpler, which sounds counterintuitive, like the format's huge. Don't the lenses need to be equally huge, right? Um, no, they don't. And we know that because there are many very, very old large format lenses which are not huge. We'll take a look at some of them today. Uh, the next thing is shutters. No one's making shutters anymore. That's not strictly true. Mm. First thing we're going to talk about is shutters. And this is a Packard Ideal. I've, I have two of these. I've taken them both apart. This one was made either in 1962 or 1966. I forget which one of them was made in each year. They, the, whoever made these, the company, when, when in the 60s when these were being made, hand wrote the date that it was assembled inside the shutter, which I think is a really nice touch. And so um, the way this works is you have a bulb and a piston here, and you just, oops, let me get my finger out of the way, uh, push the bulb, and you can open and close the shutter, or still working on the prep, this here. We'll open it, let go, and now we can do a time exposure. Uh, I do not have a pin for this, but this is a number six, so if I put a pin in the back here, uh, which I practiced with a paper clip and it works, it does an instant exposure of somewhere in the vicinity of 1 25th of a second. Smaller Packards are a little bit faster, larger Packards are a little bit slower, okay? And then there's also a model of this that comes with a flash synchro so that when you use instant, you can trigger a strobe as well. So there's three models, the six, the six synchro, and then the number five, which is only time exposure. Okay, there we go. Nope, all right, still practicing. So these are still being made by new by John Gilchrist. I think I got his last name correct. And, um, so you can get them. They do have the limitations of the relatively low shutter speeds, and they are kind of hard to mount. So one of the reasons I got this is because I have a lens, a barrel lens, I want to mount on my Intrepid 8x10. The problem with the Intrepid 8x10 is it has a circular opening that is just a hair too small for this, and if I wanted to mount this exact shutter into the 8x10, I'd have to cut into the front standard. I don't want to do that, so I have to order a smaller one. Anyway, that's my problem to deal with, not yours. But there is one shutter option being made brand new. And uh, there are, so, so if you're interested in the Packard Ideals, I'll leave a link in the video's description to the Packard Ideal website so you can learn a little bit more about those. Um, I'd better get my order in for a smaller one before you guys flood John with orders. Uh, okay, so that's a shutter option. What about other shutter options? Insofar as I know, there are no other large format shutters being made right now. But it, in theory, shouldn't be too hard. Over the course of the last 120-ish years, 
there have been a number of different shutters made. Well, if you're familiar with sheet film, you're probably familiar with Co Copal, right? Zero, 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 one, two, and three, and maybe I think there's a larger one, I forget. Uh, Comper, Compound, Compound's up to number five. Uh, Ilex uh, made shutters for a long time. So did Kodak, I believe, made some shutters, at least ball bearing shutters for some of their very old lenses. And then, of course, things like Volutes. Volutes are an awesome shutter, um, but they're all mechanically very complicated. Even the very old ball bearing shutters are mechanically complicated. There's no mystery to how they're made. The patents are out there, the design engineering drawings are out there. If you had all of the components, you could assemble one and have a reasonably good chance of having it work correctly today because there's no mystery and magic to them. But they are mechanically complicated and getting the components made would be a very large and expensive startup cost. So what, what's the solution to that? Well, I'll tell you what, if I were in charge of product development at Ilford or Kodak, or I even photo impacts, photo impacts, uh, or Adox or something like one of the one of the manufacturers that is really dedicated to making film and keeping it as a thriving product. I would be looking into this this question right now. What can we do to offer a, a a photographic product that will help us sell more film? And to me, the answer to that would be lenses and shutters for sheet film, and it doesn't have to be that complex. We don't need super mechanical components anymore because we have tiny little arm boards. So we're, if I had the technical knowledge to do the coding on this and the, the, the prototyping, I absolutely would be in working on this right now. I just don't have that knowledge. Were, were it me, I would be in charge of product research for one of these filmmakers. I would say, let's get us some summer interns in here, right? Maybe turn it into a longer internship. We need someone who can program an arm board. We need someone who can do some mechanical design. And then they just have to work together. An arm board can control mechanical components. So we know the dimensions, the standard dimensions of the Seiko, the Copal, the, the Comper, and the compound shutters and all that. We know the cell spacing and the internal dimensions and the thread pitches. There's no mystery in any of that. So if you had a housing where you had the proper cell spacing and threading with a space in between for shutter leaves, an arm board could relatively easily control those shutter leaves. It, basically, the way that the internal mechanism of a leaf shutter works is the, the most complex and advanced ones had like five leaves, okay, and they would overlap like this. And then when you trigger the shutter, they open and they open in a way that spreads the light evenly over the film all at once. So there's no mystery in the geometry of that. You could make new shutter leaves with a laser cutter in the right material. Be fairly easy to do. With a mechanical actuator connected to an arm board, you could dial in the exact shutter speed that you want up to probably a fairly hard limit of around 1 4 to 500th of a second, which is what the mechanical ones could do with a couple of noteworthy exceptions. There were very few leaf shutters that did a thousandth of a second, and most of them destroyed themselves after a few uses anyway. But at any rate, uh, if you had an arm board, you could have that trigger an actuator that would open and close the shutter on at a specific interval. Okay, what about apertures? Quite honestly, I'd just use waterhouse stops. Just have a way to drop a waterhouse stop in and, in and out of the top of it, right in front of the the shutter leaves or right behind it however it needs to be. I think most leaf shutters were behind the water, the, the aperture is behind the leaf shutters. And um, then you have your aperture and you have your shutter speed. It's a little bit fiddly and cumbersome, but it would work. And since we have things like Raspberry Pi boards, like the, the Zero or the, the Pico or other tiny ones and other brands that Raspberry Pi is just an example, it wouldn't be all that hard to create something that would be electronically controlled with a very simple mechanical interface of something that opens and closes leaves. And then the, the advantage of the Waterhouse stops is that removes a mechanical component that then no longer has to be made. But quite honestly, getting an aperture for a shutter shouldn't be that hard because you can buy 
uh, apertures for microscopes just off eBay and AliExpress, right? And they're not that expensive. Something like that could be adapted fairly well into an electronically controlled shutter. And then it's just a matter of, of figuring out the aperture scales for the specific lens that's being attached to the shutter. Copal One shutters, as an example, were used on all kinds of different lenses. And whether it was a 185.6 or a 210.56 for two examples with the same aperture, then the aperture scales on the front of that lens would have to be different. This is a volute, but there's the aperture scales down here. And so depending on the focal length and the aperture of the lens in this shutter, these scales would have been milled differently, right? And then the setting for this aperture would have been different depending on the lens in here. So, um, okay. So who's, is there, but no one's making large format lenses. About a year ago, I reached out to Jason Lane and I said to him, hey, would it be possible to engineer a Hypergon? And he said, in theory, yeah. So if you follow his Instagram and you saw his Hypergon post from however many months ago where he had a prototype, uh, that stemmed from an idea I pitched to him. I was gonna bring that to Kickstarter, was not able to get the, I was not able to do that. I don't have the ability to do that. Um, so, so I don't know if that project will ever move forward but I had really hoped to be able to take that to Kickstarter and be making a large format lens because large format lenses in and of themselves are not super hard to engineer and produce. We know this because they've been around for more than 100 years. I have, for instance, I think this is the oldest lens I have right now, this 12 inch F55 Goers Cellor lens, which according to the serial number was made 100 years ago from 1923. Shutter still works beautifully. Um, it would have been hand ground, hand engineered. It's a four element, four group lens, but it's not that big because large format lenses don't have to be all, I mean, this is a huge large format lens. This is a huge eight by 10 lens, right? But large format lenses don't have to be that big, which we know because of this 183 millimeter Zeiss Protar Series 5 8 by 10 lens in a volute shutter. Or because of this absolute monster over here. Oh gosh, this is so heavy. Joseph Snyder from 1928. It's a Dasikar 15.5 centimeter f12.5 large format lens. It's shockingly bright on the ground glass of the Intrepid, by the way, um, waiting for the lens board for it to show up. This is what I'm mounting a Packard shutter to, if you're curious. Uh, the Dasikar was, real quick history, precursor to the Angulon lenses. So this right here covers eight by 10. And for a real quick primer on eight by 10 lenses, it's not just enough to know the focal length and the aperture, you also have to know the angle that, of the light cone. And at f22, I think it is, this is 110 degrees, and I think it's 105 at, at 12.5, at f12.5. Um, real quick, 10 set, you know, dime store primer. You've got your, your element, you know your, your angle of view right here. So if you know your angle of view is 110 degrees and your focal length is 155 millimeters, now you know what your coverage is, okay? Because you can just do the basic math, 155 on your vertical for your triangle, 90 degrees out to here, uh, and then it's just a matter of adding up the angles to, 100, to 180 degrees. This is 90, this is gonna be 55, that's 145, which means that this is gonna be 35. So now you know what your image circle is from, from your, your light cone image circle and you can figure out the maximum format for that lens. So that little Dasikar will cover eight by 10. In fact, I think at F22, it covers 10 by 12. Staggeringly small lens. So the point of that is that those, all four of those lenses I showed you are either three or four element lenses and they all perform very nicely. They have good image quality and good image character and small pieces, well, two of them have small pieces of glass, and they could be milled back when we only had hand milling machines and things like crown and flint glass. With all the options we have for glass and coatings now, even if somebody like a, a filmmaker said, let's make a very simple uncoated lens just to see how this does, it could be done relatively easily. 
there are many, com many shops in the world that could, in theory, grind the elements for a cellar or Dassecker type lens. Xenars and Artons and things like that. Uh, also, Tessers, especially. Tessers would be very easy to make now. Four and three, very easy to make lens. So um, the point of that is that not all large format lenses have to be monstrous and heavy like this uh, 360 f5.5 Tele Arton, right? So is it possible to do it? Well, in theory, it should be. In theory, if you find a company that can do the grinding, and if you are either willing to use a Packard shutter, or if you are willing to um, invest the time and effort in having some whiz kids who are really good at mechanical and electronic engineering and doing some programming on an arm board, create something that could be mounted to a lens board, then this should, in theory, be attainable. And like I said, if I had the technical knowledge to do this, I would already have been working on this for quite some time. I just don't. But that's, that's got to be a major component of the future of film. We, as film photographers, absolutely need the filmmakers to say we are interested in having our product be viable for the long term. So here is what we are doing to help you film photographers have the ability to use our product. Because right now it feels like all of the filmmakers are just sitting on their duffs and saying, this is a product we've made for a hundred some odd years or however long, oh, we don't need to. We, we're gonna invest all of our R&D dollars in re-engineering emulsions as environmental laws change or predictive of them, which is an important use of time and money, don't get me wrong. But if filmmakers are only being reactive to environmental changes that affect their film emulsion, they are not being forward looking into the very significant threat that faces them in five to 10, 12 years, which is that at some point, the film equipment we have now is going to stop working. And it's not that 100% of it is going to fall off a cliff, but every year some number of film cameras, shutters and everything on, on large format lenses, some number of those fail and are no longer repairable. And there will come a time when we have hit critical mass and there is no longer enough working film equipment for film photographers to be purchasing enough film to keep the filmmakers uh, viable business entities. That's in the future, not immediately, but it is coming down the pike and that's why filmmakers need to be forward looking at that and investing some of their R&D dollars in making products that will allow their, pro their film product to survive long term. And quite frankly, large format is where photog film photography started. It's likely the future of film photography. And there are some very simple things that filmmakers could be doing to invest a small amount of their R&D dollars into large format lenses and shutters in a way that would allow their product to continue working long, time, long term and have very long term financial dividends for them. So uh, that's my spiel for today. And like I said, I wish I could do it myself. I wish I had the technical knowledge to be on the forefront of that. I just simply don't. But thank you everyone very much for watching and I will see you in the next Cameras and Coffee. And Hopefully, I am, I am very optimistic that someone will, f will figure out one of these solutions that I've pitched or something I haven't even thought about and run with it. And I really hope that's the case because uh, that I think that's an important part of the future of this, this hobby and profession that we all love very much. See you guys in the next Cameras and Coffee.